Hi, everyone. Hi. James Wesley, my husband, Seth Rudetsky. Welcome to Stars in the House. What's up? Um, today is our Sondheim celebration, but there's a big show coming up. It's on Tuesday, right? On Marissa. Tuesday. It's a big show coming up on Tuesday that we also want to promote. So we're going to begin with Marissa Tomei and then segue to a Sondheim celebration. Well, actually, and in between, Dr. John LaFouque. Our standard bearer. That's right. Um, this is Stars in the House. If you don't know, it's twice a day. It's 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. We do it for entertainment slash we also do it to raise money <clears throat> for the Actress Fund, That's right. which is what? <laughs> the Actress Fund is a national human services organization that is here for professionals in the performing arts all across the country. Yes, and sir. of course, it goes without saying that the need is greater than ever for really for the most basic of needs. And that's what the Actors Fund is there for, to help people that are professionals in performing arts all over the country, yeah. not just actors, even though that's the name, it is for everyone in the performing arts. So across the country, people on stage, backstage, in the artistic director's office, ballets, opera, dance teachers, all the dance studios across the country, think about it. It's like they make their living as dance teachers. All of those dance studios are closed right now, you know, and they're trying, I'm sure, to do their best online, yeah. but it's not everyone's working. And so the Actors Fund is there to help those people in the performing arts pay their rent, pay for food, pay for health premiums, all of that sort of stuff, medical bills, et cetera. So with that in mind, Seth, do you want to say what we just started a couple of days ago? And it's been a lot of fun about how people yes. can get their names read. Uh, online if you donate today. Yes, yeah, so if you donate, so you go to starsinthehouse.com to donate. Then when you do, you're going to get back a receipt that's like, thank you for donating. That's right. Forward that full receipt to, to starsinthehouse2020 at gmail.com. That's right. So And then uh, we're going to get a list of some of the donations and we'll have one of the stars read them. So you're going to get your name read by a star. So And it doesn't have to be like some thousand dollar donation no, five dollars five dollars i mean the average donation I, I would say at this point is around 25 dollars, but it does add up and in fact it's added up to over two hundred and forty thousand dollars raised on stars in the house yeah. in less than six weeks it's really incredible and um it's as hard as this is <laughs> work-wise it's nothing a number one compared to the people on the front lines and number two we've got a lot of people as you see on the end credits which by the way are going to be updated soon because yeah. more people, people have joined, joined which has been fantastic to help us make this happen so stars in the house 2020 once you donate at starsinthehouse.com we'll put this yeah, back you up. donate starsinthehouse.com then you email stars 2020 at gmail.com by the way That's if you're right. watching right now can you just share it wherever you're watching so share it to your facebook oh, right. share it to your is this twitter stuff right here or is and it then this one? hold on no <laughs> i you always do that whatever you're watching right now you just copy the link and share it and then on top of that, yes. follow us here. Okay. So if you if you have a Twitter account, because we want to we want to have more followers, we want to have as many because every time we pitch to a celebrity, it's like always impressive to be like we have this many followers everywhere. So follow us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. That's just That's following. Right. But post this right now so people can watch. The more people that are right. watching, the more people that will donate. Um, and people watch all over the world, which is crazy because it's like mm, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, so we're live, so people are watching live. Like, Lily, we get letters from Manila, and it's two a.m. in Manila. So, thanks everyone for watching everywhere. I would say, on that note, Seth, yes. let's bring on a certain Oscar winner who is here uh, with us today, Marissa Tomei. Marissa, hi, hi. I, hi. I love you're such a copycat with your background. <laughs> Yes, yes, you know, I was inspired by you. <laughs> um, so wait, first things, let's just first promote for five seconds and then talk, but there's other stuff we're going to talk about. But talk about this play you're doing on Tuesday, which people can watch. The tickets are so crazy cheap. I think it's like, the, they're like $20 or $25. And it goes to MCC, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a fund for Manhattan Class Company and to, uh, to keep that theater, that theater running. And why is MCC important to you, Marissa? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that's my that's my home. That's where I that's where I started. Bernie put me in my first play. I, I guess he was just starting out as a casting director, but now he's Bernie Bernie. Bernie but, Kelsey. <laughs> but uh he put me in a play called Daughters and then he was starting MCC. <clears throat> and this was one of the first plays. So that was <laughs> this play that we're going just to be re uh, reading, uh, me and Oscar Isaac, by the way. Um, we're going to uh, 
be reading Beirut and it, that we did that in 1987. Wow. So, I mean, I did it in 1987. He probably wasn't born yet, but, um, <laughs> but uh, it's, we, it was funny. I just wrote to Bernie just in the beginning of, of this pandemic and said that play is on my mind. I just can't, can you believe everything just, just to connect? It wasn't anything about a benefit or anything. I was right. just like how art, you know, affects us and lives with us and how Alan Bowne, who wrote the play in the middle of the AIDS crisis, it was about a plague. It was an unknown plague. And it's about these two young lovers trying to reach each other through this quarantine. Wow. The whole Lower East Side is a quarantine in it called Beirut. Remember in the 80s when like the Lower East Side was so burnt out, they nicknamed it Beirut. Wow. So that's thus the title of the show. And um, Alan, Alan did pass away from AIDS at 44 years old, just a, a few years later. Mm. So, but at the time, I don't, I don't know if that, we certainly didn't know that he was sick and I don't even know if he knew really, oh, um, but we were, but we did the play, the play is so beautiful and poetic and a lot about love. And, and what would you do? Right, what, so many of us right now, what would, what would we sacrifice and what would we do to be with someone we love right now? I mean, if someone is, is in the hospital, right. God forbid, right now, what 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 would you do to get there to be with them? I mean, it's a it's a love story. The, the play is, but it's that feeling like, I'm, to get there to that person. It's so um, prophetic. Is that the right word? Yeah. That he chose. He could have just as easily chosen HIV/AIDS and just done that. But that he chose something that would prove to be so timeless. It would actually make people be quarantined. I mean, that's just so interesting. It wasn't just um, people that were infected, that it was quarantined, exactly like now. Yes, that's what was. Well, the whole Lower East Side is a quarantine zone. Wow. And my character sneaks in to see the person she loves. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Are, there any, are there any laughs? It sounds a little it's dark. Funny. I was just going to say, as soon as that, that is, it sunk in with me at the same moment, I was like, but actually, it's really funny. She's got a big mouth. And, um, and you know, and they're, they're, they're combative and flirty. <laughs> you know what it makes me think of? Just segue for a minute, and we'll we'll put this up again. So it is Tuesday night. MCCtheater.org you can go to. It's at, do you know if it's at 8 o'clock? putting you on the spot. It may be I think that it's at seven. Okay. Seven. Okay. So 7 PM, but go, go to mcctheater.org and you can check out. It has all the information. It is not a hundred dollars a ticket people. This is a, it's a fundraiser. It's a, re it's a reading people. Also, it's, it's gonna There you go. <laughs> We're going to be you know, reading the paper. Like, That's right. But, but these, so, you know, these small theaters, bad. These small theaters depend on ticket sales and all the shows are canceled. You have to think logically, like where are these theaters going to get money from to survive? Like if you want to, if you want to have something beyond Broadway, people are always like, oh, Broadway. So this, you know, we need small theaters. If you want small theaters to exist, you have to start helping these types of small theaters. So you really have to support this kind of stuff. And it's also a way of processing how we're feeling. I mean, it is a piece of writing, a piece of art that actually is very prescient to this moment. Yeah. Right. Oh, look at this. Someone who originally saw you, Marissa was brilliant in Beirut, saw original. Wow. <laughs> so Marissa, yeah. speaking of comedy in the, in the midst of otherwise a heavy drama piece, I feel like All in the Family is such the epitome of that, don't you think? And it's like, I, can we talk for two seconds about your brilliant portrayals as Edith Bunker and how what that was like for you in live from a studio audience? Well, uh, I never in my wildest, never in my wildest did I think that that was going to be part of my life in any way. <laughs> playing, stepping into Edith's shoes. Wow. Um, you know, when Norman calls, and I know you're going to have the good doctor on after <laughs> this, his, his son-in-law, um, when Norman calls, you just say yes. And, um, you know, I regretted it immediately as one, as soon as I hung up the phone, I said, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> but somehow uh, he made me feel safe and like allowed, you know, just, uh, just to me to find my way really. Wow. Really, really. It was really fun because it's like what we all love about Broadway, about any, you know, off Broadway, off Broadway, all the live arts. It was live. It was live. So that's where I, it was so terrifying, 
but so thrilling. Did you, did you, uh, well, first off, did you grow up watching All in the Family like I did and obsessed? Or did you, like, how much did you know of All in the Family other than it was an iconic oh, yeah. American TV show? Oh, no, no, I watched it all the time. Yes. You I did. watched it all the time. But at the time when I was a little girl, I identified more with Gloria. I of course, really yeah. But I was, like, when I got the call, I was like, what? Of course, Gloria. No. Oh, I mean it. No. Okay. And then I had to get over that. And then I realized, so this is, this is amazing because the, the, uh, the heart that she has and how wise she is with seeming so stupid and out of it. Right. Contrast is um, really fun to play. And did you watch, did you watch episodes to like, how did you prepare, how do you prepare for that and to step into that kind of role? I just read the the script that he sent me and we just worked on it as if we were starting. Wow. Fresh. That was Norman's advice too. And wow. brilliant advice, of course. And, then, um, yeah, I never watched the episode that we did, though. I particularly that smart from that. And then after I kind of got my footing with what I sensed was in the script that he had sent, then I watched a little bit of it to just see, I guess, because you know why? Because they give a lot of background in those shows. So you find out where Edith grew up. And, oh, wow. where was and where she just worked. So less about mimicking, but more about the history that they had built into the characters. Yeah. Over time. It was it was really brilliant. And uh, I, I loved how you made it your own and everyone. Yeah, we, it was really great. We loved it. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. Yeah. Okay, so let's put up, before you, before you take off here, let's put up again, mcctheater.org, Tuesday night. And um, Beirut, tickets are cheap. The, yep, tickets are cheap. Tickets are Yes. And uh, it's called Beirut. I'm in LA right now, and I was just in New York all last year for Rose Tattoo, and I feel so, I, I, I feel strange about not being there. I had just come out here to just start a job and uh, breaking. My whole family's there. Everyone's in the, and they live in the village. Uh, My parents, they're older. Oh. Uh, keep telling them to wear their masks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we were just because we we have a, a house about an hour outside the city, but we were in the city yesterday. And definitely it's going to be something we talked to Dr. LaPook with in a minute, because it was like there were definitely people that were wearing masks, but there were a lot of people that weren't. And it it made me nervous and made, you know, it it's, it made yeah. me a little bit uncomfortable to see that Cuts. many people, you know. So anyway, yeah, where yeah, you keep have... telling your parents. Mr. And Mrs. Yeah, Tomei, they're on it. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, so Marissa, Marissa, Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye. Dr. Okay. Go. On that note, let's bring on Dr. John LaPook. Hi, guys. Hi, Dr. LaPook. I think I belong to a rare club. Um, I saw Marissa in the original Beirut live because uh, my sister-in-law, Maggie, was very involved with MCC at, the, at its beginning. And then I saw her live also uh, in the All in the Family uh, reboot recently. Oh, wow. I was I was one of the live people in the audience. Dr. Uh, LaCook, I've never been more jealous of you in my life. She was so brilliant. You know what was so great? Forget about all the physical stuff that her loping, running to the kitchen knew. She, yeah. it, it's just, she just, and the voice. But she just totally like I know what I'm talking about, like I right. But I mean, I'm just saying as an audience member. Yeah. What was so brilliant is that you you felt that she went for it. You know, like when you're doing a back dive in the pool, you have to go for it. Like if you otherwise you're gonna land on your back. So right. She just went for it, and you could see it when she did the. Um, those were the days. Um, those were the day. You know, oh, but she yeah. the way her voice you know goes very high and shrill at one point. And she just went for it, you know, <laughs> and she just- Yeah, we loved it. Nailed it. And then her acting was so brilliant. It was a very moving episode, of course, about a, do uh, you know, a, a draft dodger, right. um, you know, who was coming to dinner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And all of the, the nuances and mixed emotions there in the middle of the Vietnam War. Anyway, brilliant. Oh, She's brilliant. We loved it. Yeah. So, so can you help us set the record straight about the whole thing about disinfectants and what we're- yeah. Getting out there. Yeah. So just to get it straight, because people do misinterpret things, you know, if you're thinking out loud versus this is medical advice. Um, we're talking about using disinfectants on your hands 
for example, because the virus uh, melts away with it. Under no circumstances ever do you take something like Lysol internally by swallowing it or intravenously because it could kill you. And uh, in fact, I had a patient, a young boy, when I was a medical student who drank Lysol um, uh, by mistake and had severe scarring of the esophagus. He ended up needing to get, you know, a breathing, a special trach, you know, a breathing tube. It was, it was a disaster. So, um, you know, people with no medical background may hear that and think, you know, well, let me give it a try. I'm feeling really sick. Uh, but under no circumstances, in fact, the makers of Lysol, so unusual. They, they actually came out and said, look, under no circumstances do you take this internally in any way, shape, or form. So just to set the record straight, I think it's important to just get on record with that. And even, even if it's obvious to some people, it may not be obvious to everybody. So so you, I don't know if you heard my, uh, my question or comment to Marissa about us. We were in the city yesterday gathering some things uh, to bring back to our house. And you know, it was a beautiful day. And of course, it wasn't just a beautiful day in New York, but it was a beautiful day in Southern California. And seeing all the people in Orange County, I'm sure you've seen the images of people on the beaches. And you know, we saw on, on Hudson River. You know, there's the uh, people who don't know. There's like basically a, a, a jogging path or a bike path that goes up and down Manhattan. And there were so many people that were so close by. Some with masks. There were a fair number that did, but a lot that didn't, and were really close. Like. I, am I am I crazy that I'm? It makes me nervous that I'm seeing these images in real life and on TV. Not at all. Um, and but it, you can understand it, right? So right now, uh, the worst thing we can do. Well, probably not the worst thing. There are probably worst worst things that we can do. But a terrible thing to do right now would be to have a false sense of confidence, just as as the the curve is flattening, not even necessarily dropping, and letting our foot off the get uh, the gas and then having it roar back. So we have to absolutely still be doing all of the things that we've been doing with the physical distancing and, and being careful. Um, of course, we need to have more testing so that we know are there areas where it seems safer than others, but otherwise, if you're gonna just say, I'm fed up and I'm going out, it's, you know, you're doing it blindly. I will say, I wanna just give a nod to the moment in time where we are right now psychologically, which is people are fed up. Yeah. They're fed up. You know, at the beginning, it's maybe there's a little bit of oddly an adventure to it. Mm. You're home, you're, you're with your family, you're doing unusual things, you're maybe there's some positives to it. And now you're fed up. And it's it's a moment when it's natural to think about just going out, but now it starts to hit you. I think I've told you before, my father uh, in 2009, my parents were married for 66 years. And my father, a couple of months after my mother had died, said to me, is it okay that I'm pre still pretending that, is it okay that I'm pretending she's still at the hairdresser? Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's that moment where you're realizing, I can't pretend that she's still at the hairdresser anymore. She's not at the hairdresser. And I think people right now, it's hitting them, like after the fight flight, you know, immediate reaction. Um, this is real. It's going to last longer, and it's and it's it's hard. We have to acknowledge that. I feel like we're uh, to use your phrase, which we love. There's a beginning, middle, and end. I it feels like some sometime in the last week we've definitely entered the middle, and the middle is is I I, I almost it's a different type of difficult. You know yeah. what I mean? It's it's different. The other, I because Seth and I were talking yesterday in in the car of like how we've heard so long, you know, for so long about flattening the curve, but then what? And I feel like we're, not that it's necessarily flattened, obviously, in a lot of locations, but then it's like, then what do we do? And so people are going to the beach and at the park. I, 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 I don't, I don't, I'm not looking for an answer. I just, it's almost like I'm just, it's frustrating. It's causing me anxiety, yeah. you know? Yeah. I'm thing. Go ahead. So just the one thing I wanted to ask before we begin the sauna thing is they keep saying, oh, don't worry, we're going to start doing temperature tests. Oh, right. People take your temperature before you go back to work. And I was like, but now we know people don't always have a temperature. So what are they even talking about? Right. Yeah. Um, that's not a foolproof way. Uh, people can have temperatures from other things. You can have a no, no temperature. Remember, temperatures do spikes. So, you know, you have a spike. I you know, I talk to patients who have COVID and they get, they wake up and they're fine. And then they spike in the afternoon, for example, then they go down and it goes back up again. So you're not going to rely on the temperature right. for
for right. that. Um, so, uh, so it's not. So there, there are a lot of public officials saying that that's what they're going to do, but that's not really going to prove anything, will it? That's it's like not going to prove anything, yeah. and and uh, it's not sensitive and it's not specific. You can have fever from lots of things that aren't COVID, right. of course. Um, you know, one last thing. Just I know we're thinking America. But if, around the world, and especially in Africa, I am so worried about Africa right now because uh, the resources for testing, for treatment, you know, in terms of just supportive treatment are, are, are very, very, you know, minimal in some areas. And they have, remember, they, people there get fever from malaria. Malaria kills so many people every year in Africa. Mm -hmm. So that's on top of this, and it's confusing there. So right. We're worried about us, but we have to still think globally. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you as always, Dr. LePook. All right. No Sondheim. You have a good rest. That's yes, right. Yes, a lot of time I'm coming. Have okay. a good rest of your Sunday. Uh, okay. Everyone keeps everyone keeps uh, making very sweet comments about you. Here are some nice Aww. prayer hands. Aww. I can't pretend to have the hairdresser. I love that. And there was one very specific one. Does anyone think that you look like Leslie Nielsen? So I get that a lot. Okay, well, that's good to know. Stop calling me Shirley. <laughs> exactly. All right, bye. Shirley will be back. Bye. Hilarious. Um, Okie dokie. All right, Seth. So I'm keeping track of the donations. Um, oh, okay, good. Okay. So uh, okay. this is where I just sit back and watch. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been sign I'm obsessing like, all morning. I'll, I'll move in the background here. You take over, Seth. All right, Queens. So today <laughs> is the anniversary of a certain show opening. Perhaps oh, recognize. There we go. Now, for those of you that are under 30, that phrase is based on a busy signal. A busy signal used to happen when you would pick up the phone, rotary dot. I mean, the point is it's a busy <laughs> signal. And, you know, companies have had a lot of people calling each other because, like, we're all friends. So that's what that's based on. Just a little bit of inside scoop. So today's the anniversary of company. Company opened up 10 years ago today. Just kidding. Ah. 50 <laughs> effing years ago. And I have two of the original stars right here. Uh -huh. The lovely original Marta, Miss Pamela Meyer. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Pamela. Hi, Hi, lady. Hi, everyone. Hi, lady. Uh, you're, um, you're um feeding yeah, back. back. And I don't know why. Don't know why. What? Um, um, I'm feeding sorry. back. Yeah, like your yeah, speakers like your on, speakers or, something. on or something. Um, turn off your no. Don't mute yourself. That's crazy. That's going too far, dear. Maybe turn off the volume, the volume on your speaker, on your, speaker. On oh, your computer. Okay. I don't know how to do that, but I'll try. Lower the volume on your laptop. Is that better? Let me see. No. It is better. It is better. Oh, no, it's okay. not. No, it's not. Okay, so okay, don't know so how to fix that. It's going to drive me crazy. Drive me crazy. Uh, I'm going to have. Okay, wait a minute. Try uh, this again. Is that better? Pam Myers? Pam Myers? No. Yeah. I, hearing, I literally keep hearing myself. myself. So, so I'm bringing I'm Terry Ralston. Ralston. I'm going to have my friend David have talk to you. So you peace okay, out for a minute. So. Okay. Can you have David? Yes. Why Thank don't I, you. Why don't I? Uh, okay. I'll go, Seth. You take we're going to go old school. Since company was done without mics, we're going to go acoustically. <laughs> what? Doesn't make any sense. All right. I'm going to bring in Miss Terry Ralston. So Pam, David's going to contact you. Um, hi, Terry Ralston. Hey, Seth. Thank um, you for this today. Thank I'm you. Sorry, you. By the way, Terry was the original Jenny, if you don't know. She was original. Blue. Re happily referred to as the pot smoker. People ask me what role I was in. I said, the pot scene, you know. <laughs> pot, you pot, you. I think we were as the soprano, but uh, uh, yeah, the pot smoker. Okay. Yes, yes. So Terry Ralston, you had done what Broadway show had you done? Because company was 1970. Had you done any Broadway shows before then? Oh God, no! I graduated from college that year. Yeah, yeah really, literally the, um, the the year before I graduated from college, I came east and got Jacques Brel right away. And that same year after I graduated, I I got company. And little did I know what that was going to do. Oh very my God! Naive, very naive. So I hear that a lot of times Sondheim, I hear a lot of times Sondheim does shows sort of is writing them during the rehearsal process. Was uh -huh. that the company? Were, were songs being written during the rehearsal process? Um, no. I mean, you know, at another time we'll compare some of the stuff because uh, I was also in a little night music. We'll talk about that at another time, which which did have stuff written during, you know, which, which I'll talk about later. Company was pretty much intact um, to the extent that we, we had five weeks rehearsal in New York, 
And um, Hal was so, you know, felt so good about it that we did a gypsy run through. Um, I guess, was it at the Schubert? I, I, you know, I don't remember what theater. On a bare stage, no costumes. And this was after five weeks of rehearsal before we went on the road. So, you know, certainly, you know, you, you've all heard the stories of, you know, being alive. <laughs> the different all yeah, you know, there were three different versions of that. But it was in amazingly good shape. So, I, mean, okay. yeah, oh, I was just going to say, well, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, you, we'll keep going with that. Well, there's there's one thing that changed when we were on the road that is very it's not talked about very much. Um, there was um, another scene at the end of the show. Uh, we all came back as different characters. And, you know, I know somewhere in my archives, I have this script. I've got to find it because it was a whole scene and we all came back as different characters. And. I, I I ended up with Bobby. Jenny ended up with Bobby. And um, there was a scene. Yeah, there was a Wait, scene. Were you a, Jenny or were you somebody else? No, I was somebody else. I, in, in George's first mind, Jenny was the perfect female. You know, I was, you know, of course, I was a stay-at-home wife. But, but I was kind of like the ideal female in their mind. At any rate, in George's first mind. So so the scene was written where, as a different character, um, we all come back as different people, and Bobby ends up with me. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the, the thing that, that I remember as the funniest thing about all that, because that would have been a big, big deal for my character, right, that I end up with Bobby. And they, they gave me this really great um, jacket, one of those sheepskin jackets, and um, which was my costume. And so when the scene, you know, it didn't work, you know, they cut it. And when it was cut, everyone- We wanted that coat though. Oh, I know, I know. So, so when everyone came up to me at the end and said, oh, Terry, you must be devastated. This is cut and I, this is literally what I said. But do I get to keep the coat? <laughs> literally? <laughs> That's what- She did. Yeah. She and, did. But Ruth Mitchell got it. I didn't get it. Got it. Yeah. Son of a bee. Yeah. Uh, yep. Pam Myers, you're here. I'm going to give everyone just a little taste of a little Pam Myers. If you don't know the song Pam Myers sang, it was this. Still got it. <laughs> yes, you know it. All right, so I want to talk to I want to talk to Danielle for a second. I'm going to bring Danielle on. So Danielle Ferlin, where are you, dear? The original Little Bird Riding Hood. Hi, Hi. Hello, ladies. How Hi. Are you? Hi. You're all Sondheim originators. Oh um, my God, this yeah. is so much fun. I can't stand it. It's exciting. <laughs> so Danielle, I love this picture. This is the recording session you did for um Into the Woods. Into the yes, I look so serene. Look at me. I'm like so pensive. It's nice. Well, I want to go. <laughs> I want to go back though for a second because we were talking about how Sondheim writes stuff uh, <clears throat> last minute. I remember we did that that 50th anniversary. Uh, no, sorry, 80th birthday for Sondheim, and yeah. I was standing with Nancy Opal before we went on stage, and she told me that it's hot up here. Was basically like written in the morning. You rehearsed it that afternoon and then did it that night when you did sending the park. Is that true? Oh, I remember that. Well, bear in mind that this was like many. I was I went through a lot of things since then. I was so so young. But yeah, I mean, it was. I remember so many changes with that and into the woods. Like unbelievable. I mean, it was it was quick. I I remember things being cut and added. And I was always amazed at how people, none of it affected me, not that much, you know, that did. But I would be like, how do they remember that? I don't understand. It's like, this oh. is what I aspire to as an adult. Like, how do you oh, keep that I up? Remember. It's amazing. Nancy Opal told me that for It's Hot Up Here, people wrote the lyrics on the set pieces. Oh my gosh. That's right, because there were the pop ups, the little animals. <laughs> And then it just goes away. You're like, what, what lyrics? I don't know. Exactly. We didn't have any place to write lyrics. It was all see-through. Well, and it's not like you're cheating at school and you can write it on your arm, you know? I didn't do that, though. I, I never did that, so. Here is his, here's the original Sunday cast. Uh, do you notice who's my, who is above me in that picture? 
Wait. That is not Dana Ivy. Oh my God. Wait a minute. It's um wait it's it's Charlotte Moore. Charlotte Moore. Oh my yes. god. Ah! Look at how young everybody is. Oh my gosh. Look at how short Bernadette is. I know. <laughs> She's like my height. I know. I love it. So, so I, I, you've been acting since you were a little kid, right, Danielle? I have been, yes. Um, okay, so I just found this crazy audition clip of you. <laughs> Is it the cough syrup commercial? It's this. Okay, Slate. Hi, my name is Danielle Froney, and my manager Mary, is Mary Ann Leone. Terrific talent. And I'm 12 years old. <laughs> Look at the glasses. I mean, why? Why? The reason I say that, Danielle, is because literally my manager was terrific talent. I you, no him. way! Oh, 100%. Really? So when That's we, amazing. We had this system worked out where she didn't want she didn't want me to, I was in school still like you are. So yeah. she didn't want me to spend like a dime on a phone call. So you would call right. person to person and yeah. say, first person call from Seth Rudesky. If there was an audition, they would tell you to call back, right? I can't believe you remember that. And then I would, that's amazing. She was so, that's crazy. Yeah, wow. Is this is taking me back. And I love our careers remain the same. You originated two Sondheim roles, and I saw them. Okay, so um, <laughs> talk to me for a second about playing Little Red Riding Hood. Do you remember, did Sondheim play the song for you? Like, how did that work? Well, first of all, I always, re I remember, like, one of my favorite things, of the first read-through, when you're sitting there, you know, and he plays through the music and sings through it himself. You just, you just feel like, you know, it just comes from his heart, and he's, like, doing that. I remember so many changes in that show. I mean, the Little Red song did not change that much, not from what I remember, because I did the I did the first reading of that show where Chip Zion played a prince in the reading, in the first reading. He can verify that, like I'm telling, it was insane. But yeah, I, I worked up that from the beginning. I know, he needed to- That's so cool. It was very cool, but the Little Red song didn't change that much. I remember the Jack, Jack song changed a lot and the Cinderella song, but there were so many different, so many different things that happened with that. We did a workshop of three different endings of that show a few weeks before the Broadway rehearsals started. Wait a minute, that's since Marry Me a Little. Really? Yeah. So they brought us in. We rehearsed for two weeks. I think did endings A, B, and C. And then they sort of reevaluated and went away. And we came back a few weeks later and started the official rehearsal process. What were the other endings? Well, in one of them, the ba uh, the mysterious man, I'm sorry, the narrator tells the baker, it's obvious that the child that the baker is holding is uh, the narrator. Like there's all this speculation, is the child this man who grew up? And he, he would say, it was heartbreaking. He would say something to the effect of, you know, you always cried when I, he always cried when I held him. And then the, mm. or the narrator said, I always cried when you held me. And there's of course the whole thing about he plays the mysterious man who's the baker's father. And um, that was one of the endings. Um, I don't really remember the other, there were three. And was it weird to play? Cause you know, looking back you go, oh, that's a child coming to terms with their sexuality. But right. when you're a kid, you don't really know that. Did you know what your song was about? We didn't talk about it. It's funny because a lot of people say, I mean, obviously, I think the the less I knew, <laughs> it was easier <laughs> to play. I was just shooting from the hip. I didn't have any, I was a little, I was a late bloomer. I was a little, you know, naive myself. I mean, and I just, I just kind of played it as a so <laughs> Well, <you> just, <laughs> But it was, it was, um, I didn't really think about it at the time. They didn't approach it that way. We talked about how it made me feel. And I think Lapine, especially as the director, always just wanted to bring the organic feelings out of me. He was such a great director for me as a young person. He, we never talked about other stuff. He knew how to work with me specifically to bring the best performance out of me. It was, it was unbelievable without like bringing all that other stuff in. It was only later on. I was like, is that what that song's about? Really, right, right. Yeah. You, you bring such great choices the way I think this is you. Hold on. <laughs> and we're back yes. at the start. And I know things now, many valuable things that I hadn't known before. Do not put your faith in a cape and a hood. They will not protect you the way that they should. And take extra care with strangers. Even flowers have their dangers. And though scary is exciting, nice is different than good. Now I know, don't be scared. Granny is righteous, be prepared. Isn't it nice to know a lot? And a little bit not. You 
saved our lives. Oh. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so speaking of that specific ending, Chris wants to know, does Danielle remember the preview performance where the cape wouldn't come off? Yes, I remember because Chip and I were, you know, we're like this far apart. We're like, <laughs> we couldn't get the thing off. And I remember when we finally, he like, because you can see the terror in someone's eyes when that happens. We've all been there. And you're like, oh. And I was like, <laughs> I can't get it. And he ripped it. And he was like, ah. And the whole you know, place erupts in cheers. Oh my gosh, those are the best moments. When stuff when stuff happens, you know? I was there during the previews. I was during the previews. I think the set fell down. Like one of the trees fell down. Yeah, and you know when the set fell down, I remember I used to take the train with Barbara Brin to Connecticut. We'd run to the station together because it was always like, are we going to make the train? Because the show was so long. And if the set fell down, you're like. I, I'm missing the train. There's like, there's no way, you know. It's exactly. true. You're like, you're old. And then you know the Tom. Aldridge or later Dick Cavett would come out and sort of improv, you know, like sort of, hey, you know, as a narrator, you have the built in guy to like, you know, you know, enter the fourth wall. Pretty amazing. Uh, uh, question. My park badge fell over on top of me. On top of you? Yes, it did. It hit the side. It came out on a wagon. It oh, hit the flat oh my gosh. and fell off. And it was it was metal and it fell over on top of me. Oh. And um Larry was doing the show then, and he, he didn't know what to do. He just stood there. So I got up. I crawled out from under it and picked it up and put it back up on the platform. And all the time you hear, do, 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 do. Oh just Bambi. God. Yeah, that's right. That's that, right. But Remember wait. when the elevators didn't work? They yeah. had a couple of those nights. Yeah. That was, that was people scurrying. Oh, when my you know, God. A couple of times the elevators didn't work. Yeah, and also once that we had this big Lego set that was behind us and yeah. it would slide out and, and this drop would come in and it came down in the middle of the Lego set and and crashed, everything went flying. And, we're, you know, we're in the middle of the pot scene, right? And, you know, I think the reporter said, I heard the strangest sounds, you know. Our, our swinging doors didn't uh, work either. Those swinging doors that were supposed to open and before do 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 do, and we three of us got trapped behind there. So they had to um, do an extra do 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 do, you know, while we could get out there on stage. That was crazy. So, Danielle, crazy. I made it. it was very stressful when that happened. It was oh, my very gosh. Stressful. I'm you know, I it. wanted to tell you one thing, since Donna's not with us, about how unique opening night was because. Her dance literally stopped the show so cold that Hal Prince came up on stage, backstage from the audience and wanted her to take a bow. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Remember that? I mean, that was mind-blowing. And I was watching from stage left. She had gone off stage right, and he was forcing her to take a bow, and she didn't want to. He wanted to get the show going again because it was stopped cold. But she didn't want to be out of character. Wow. So it was pretty amazing. She didn't. Oh, I look so classy. Hey, um, Danielle, before you go, someone has a question. Sure. Danielle, how is your aunt? I know she's a nurse, but you can go at my clinic. Oh, I know that um, this is so interesting. It's my mom's sister. She unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Oh, no. Um, yeah. I mean, we weren't tremendously close, but it was really hard. It was my mom's only sister. And yeah, it was tough but yeah i thought about her actually i thought she would be a nurse in new york city right now i mean on the front lines it's just this is all just crazy where i live in um south orange new jersey and it was interesting i was listening to your other segments about people in masks and you know my husband just said yesterday i don't want to go out because people aren't some people are great about it but even with a mask on they don't respect the six feet and you're it, it gets here too really stressful. cincinnati and terry's yeah. in mexico right now oh wow Wow. It's the same thing. I'm in Cincinnati, and, and it's about half and half people. Yeah. It's hardly up the wall. All right, so, Dana, I'm going to bring you back. I want to have, like, a full Into the Woods reunion. So I we'll love have, it. Because I'm going to bring back Chip. And so you're going to come back for that. So you peace out for now. Fantastic. Love having you here. Now thank I'm going to focus you. a little bit. Oh. Safe and well. Don't. I was going to say thank Safe you. Safe and well, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Danielle. Bye. Thank Good you. to see Bye. you. You too. Bye -bye. Good to see you, ladies. Bye, Sam. <laughs> thank you. All right, lady. So for those of you that don't remember Terry Rawson, so Terry, when you got your big soprano solo in Getting Married Today, were you excited to get to, you had like one of the biggest female solos in the show out of the wives? Well, 
what what had happened was I um, at one point Steve came to me and you know <laughs> everybody had their songs and everything and and Steve said you know we just can't find a place for you a song for you and originally you know the bless this day was was, was a chorus was a whole group of people singing it, like a, 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 a church choir. He said, we don't have a song for you, so we want to give you the solo. <laughs> we want to make that a solo. So so they made it a solo, which was really sweet, you know. So that was amazing on it. I love <laughs> that person. You got the job, Mary. <laughs> well, I, I'm happy to say I feel very blessed because um, I still have all the high notes and, you know, the voice is very much intact and I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> I love it. Now, by the way, why are you in Mexico right now? You live there? No, um, I have a couple of homes. I, I have my place in New York and um, I have a place, luckily, oh my God, I'm so grateful. I, I am in, I have a place in Palm Springs. And I have a place in Rosarita Beach, Mexico. So, so I was I in Ohio. Uh, actually, I went back to New York. I went back to New York to do, um, you know, for the reunion that they were having at Lincoln Center. Yeah. And the next day it, it got, you know, canceled. So uh, I hightailed it back to Palm Springs. So I've been hanging out there, which I know is a lot easier than New York. And then, I came down a couple of days ago to Mexico. That, that's the ocean behind me. Uh, and, um, but I got to tell you, um, I, I woke up today and it's of course very isolated down here. And, but I have not been feeling lonely, you know, thanks to your programs and my little dog and, and friends on the phone. But I woke up this morning and felt deeply lonely, deeply lonely, the company reunion, company, which is all about friends and company, <laughs> you know, and I felt, and you know, Seth, thank you for today, this, you know, you started playing that opening of company, the tears started, you know, yeah. and uh, I'm feeling, you know, I feel it. really time of reflection and gratefulness for having had this amazing opportunity and, and spent my adult life, um, basically ha having the wonderful association with, with, you know, Sondheim and Hal Prince yep. and, you know, all these incredible people. And, you know, like my company friends are, I mean, I talk to Donna every day and, you know, uh, it's still, still family. So thank you for this today. I, I feel, I, I feel you, you like me. <laughs> I feel no, those are us, you know, we all grew up in the album. I'm going to bring on someone else who's obsessed with company when he was, a much younger man because he started originally uh, the amazing Lonnie Price. Hi, Lonnie. Hey, Lonnie. Hi, Lonnie. Yeah, hi. So, Lonnie, were you when alive did, then? When did okay. you see? Were you alive then? When we I were alive then? Yeah, I sure. You was. Saw it, right. <laughs> I was, you know, I was thinking, you know, just um, being Terry and Pam, just um, that, like, that is literally my favorite album. I mean, that's the Desert Island. If there's Aww. one. If there's one this album, it's company. It's just I, like I, I just album. I want to say, um, Lonnie, your product. Well, I, I got to be careful when I say this, but your production of you know company that you directed is the Oops. is the only one that oh. I truly love. Look out there for a second. I truly, truly love what you did with that. Thank you. So thank you for that. You were so true to who these characters were. Oh, thank you. I got a great cast. I was really lucky, but that means a lot. To me. My, the sound is pooping out on. Girl, it's fine where we are. I've never heard a more present, forward voice. <laughs> it cuts through, Pammy. <laughs> Lonnie, um, are you wait, Terry? You talking about the concert with Neil Patrick Harris? The concert? Yes, party? yes. So wait, Lonnie, talk about that because you were saying before that people had to rehearse in different cities. What the hell was that? What that happened? Was, it was out of its mind, insane. Um, Neil, Neil was in L.A. Um, and was and John Cryer was in L.A. and 
Chris, uh, and yeah, and so a bunch were in LA. We worked at Colbert's studio with just him. I think we worked in Connecticut with Patty. Um, we, uh, we, we, the entire cast was not there until I think the day of is possible. We had a, we had a, a double cast that kids at Pace University, uh, in the, you know, would take a role of anybody like Colbert had to go back. And so a kid played him. Uh, and it was extraordinary to see someone like Patty Lupone play with a high school student and play, <laughs> I mean, full out. I mean, she was just, she was doing it. And these kids who, you know, were students were, you know, getting that experience. Uh, we sent the choreography and they had it on their phones. And so they would be doing it in different cities. There were more cities than just LA and New York. I don't remember, but there were, it, it didn't until the end. And that was because we had to go to Josh Rhodes choreographer that he'd made all of these tapes from the front and the back. So people could see mirror versions of themselves. Uh, it was, it was uh, extraordinary. A great, a great bunch of people. They I mean, were- look how many opportunities there were for accidents. Out, Bobby, 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 Bobby baby, Bobby, Bobby, Robbie, Robert, darling, Bobby. Angel, will you do me a favor? Name it, Sarah. Bob. Listen, pal, I need Bobby. your opinion. Bobby, love, try me, Peter. Bobby, Bobby, there's a problem. Bobby, Bobby. I need your advice. Amy, can I call you back tomorrow? This is the kids once or twice. What's happened to you, Bobby? Bobby, Bobby. Bobby. where have you been? Come on up, we're 14, they're out. Oh, anyway. Did I do something wrong? <laughs> exactly, did I do something wrong? So mm-hmm. fabulous. So wait, um, Terry, do you remember when you guys first learned the song and did you have a breakdown? Let, oh. me, let me give you a couple of quick stories. Yes, I remember the first day with great fondness. It was, you know, <laughs> Miss Pincus did the, um, you know, it was all written by hand, page after page after page. And, and one thing I remember was, I mean, I didn't know any better. I mean, you know, as I say, I just, you know, I was so naive, but it looked kind of overwhelming. And Barbara Berry was, you know, turning page out and, and she lost track of it. I mean, she dropped it and it like a, it, and the court, it just kept rolling out across the floor. All the way across. She, she's picking it up and she looks up sheepishly and she said, it's my first musical, you know. <laughs> and then Stretch, on the other hand, oh. was looking at this, and she was saying, "Oh my God, can you imagine them doing this in summer stock?" You know. <laughs> well, and, it took eight know. hours to get like one or two pages. I yeah. mean, it was so hard for us. I have <laughs> a I have a thing that I do in my. Uh, my cabaret show where I do just my parts, you know, and I'll do Bobby, <laughs> Bobby, baby. Right. Come on over for dinner. <laughs> not, not, not what I can't understand is, of course, <laughs> uh, understudies that, that would understudy like three roles and have to oh. know. Oh, my God. Swing people. Well, I don't know how they do that. Lonnie, is that the show that got you obsessed with Sondheim? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was... Uh, um, I, um, I was, uh, I, I don't know if I told you this, but um, uh, I, I wanted to see, uh, I was a kid, I loved all the full page ads in the Times and stuff on Sunday, and I wanted to see applause because I liked the drawing, and they couldn't get tickets for it. And, um, and that was fun too. Had a new show opened, it's supposed to be great for kids. So my grandmother and I would see company on the occasion of my 10th birthday. Um, <laughs> so um, that was my, that was my uh, first moment with it. And, uh, That's you know, hilarious! And, yeah, it changed my I mean, life. We had swear words in it for Pete's sake. Yeah. I, mean, I had well, to say "son of a bitch" and and oh ass. God. We're sitting I mean, there. come on. First Saturday matinee, I saw Dean Jones. I think it had really just opened, and um, <laughs> but the the sound of the music just was thrilling to me in the same way it's thrilling to me now. So it was that uh, <laughs> I still feel the same way I did all those years. Ago. Well, it's not that weird line again. Like, yeah. Just a second. This is the original manuscript from another hundred people, by the way. Where? Oh wow! Look oh my that. God! You have it framed. 
That's so because cool. look at the key. It's in the key of E. Well, that's the, oh my god, that's a lot of belting. Lonnie, by the way, it's not that weird that you were so advanced. My friend Alan Katz apparently went to elementary school with you, and he found an old elementary school like newsletter, and on the bottom it has kids' hobbies in first grade, and everyone is like flying a kite. And can you see your hobby? No. It really says producing plays. Oh my god. That is insane. That is, will you send it to me? Will you send me a copy? Yes. Of that? Gotta see that. That is, how, wow. how did you know that? Thank you, Alan Katz. How did you know you were going to produce plays? Well, direct plays, really, but still. I have, that, I have no idea. I mean, I, I've been going to the theater since so I was four years old. So, I mean, I just, I guess it was just, yeah. I saw Oliver when I was four years old. If you don't watch your right. theater, don't take wow. it. Don't take it. So, Pam Myers, you know, I'm totally. Yeah. Obsessed. I'm obsessed with the orchestration for another hundred people, and yeah. I found this. Um, I found this video where I broke down the different sections with you. So here, take a take a gander at this. And there's well, this is from my show Broadway 101. Take a so, oh my god, I'm obsessed. So just wait. Okay, so the piano part sounds like this. The way Sondheim wrote it, it sounded like this. Hear those eighth notes. Thank you, Brent. Brent Allen Huffman, bravo. Okay, so a lot of eighth notes there, people. So what Jonathan Tunick did was he took that and he gave that to the woodwinds. So it sounds like this. Hear all the different eighth notes? New, 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 new. Okay, so that's what Jonathan Tunick did. He took that part. Now, what's cool about an orchestra is that it could have a multitude of parts going on at one time. So while the woodwinds are doing that, the strings are playing this counter melody that I'm totally obsessed with. Listen. It goes higher. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay, so that's what the strings are doing. Now, the coolest part of the orchestration is, is this whole like kind of like little secret entrance way. Let me describe it. In the opening number of Company, all the cast members are singing for the lead character, Bobby and they're all like obsessed with him. So it sounds like this. They go, Bobby, Bobby. Okay, that's how the opening number goes. Well, since Another Hundred People is about the hustle and bustle in New York, Jonathan Tunick took that phrase from the opening number and he puts it within Another Hundred People. So the trumpets, you know, they're sort of like representing like a lot of people in New York calling each other. So while all that is happening, the trumpets are playing this. Okay, down, down. We're back, right? 1970. Okay, <laughs> that cool. This is 1970. It's when it came out. Okay, so now let's hear all those parts together. The woodwinds playing their crazy eighth notes. The rhythm section, of course, playing their regular part. The strings playing the beautiful counter melody, and then the trumpets doing the bobby. Bobby sounds like this. Cool. It's so amazing. Okay. So now I want you to hear the whole song as it actually goes, sung by someone who sung it before. I'm talking about the original singer of it, 1970, still singing in the original key. Please welcome Paolo Bayer.
God. God. Oh, thank you for that, Seth. That's been 50 years. Holy cow. That wasn't that long ago, and you're still the original what, crew lady. What a pleasure. What a pleasure. Thank you. That was wow. thrilling. That was really thrilling. I mean, God, you just originated. That was thrilling for me. One of the most iconic pieces, man. You got to be there for it. It's just unbelievable. But let's start the dishing. I want an Elaine well, Stritch story. Elaine Stritch from each of you. <laughs> Terry Ross, you go first. <laughs> oh, where do I begin? Um, oh. Well, as I say, I was very young and very naive, and I didn't know what there was to fear. Let me think. Um, I, I wasn't afraid of her, you know? And consequently, she ended up respecting me for it. I mean, there was one day where uh, she was really rude to Hal Hastings, our conductor. And, you know, she just said, oh, Hal. And, you know, little me, oh, Elaine. You know, I shot it right back to her. And so as I was leaving the theater, she kind of came up and pushed me against the wall and said, did you, did you uh, say that? Would you, you, and, and, and I said, yeah, that was rude, you know. And I mean, I didn't know any better, you know. And Elaine and I became fast friends. She, she you know, respected that. She respected it. I mean, there were other times, you know, where we would have little clashes. And, and she would sort of suck you into your, her life, which which you um, didn't know. I was, oh my God, th I'll make this brief. I was with her. She came to New York, um, to LA when she was, um, you've all heard the story if you've seen Elaine at Liberty. Um, when she went and auditioned for, um, Golden you know, Girls. Golden Girls. Oh God. She, she had asked me if I'd go over lines with her. And um, so I did. And then I drove her to the audition and I sat in the, in the waiting room with her. And she came out and she said, well, I don't think I'm going to get that one. And that's, you know, the story that she tells. She went in and she said she was nervous. And um, she said, now, I hope you don't mind, but I've changed some of the words around just to fit my fit me. And, of course, everyone just blanched. And, and so that made her more nervous. So, so this is how she explained it to me. She didn't always explain it this way in her, in her telling of the story. But I know because I got it right there the moment it happened. And... Um, she said, so that made me nervous. So I tried to make light of it. And she said, well, you know, I just want to change a few words. I, I'm, I'm Catholic and I don't want to say, oh, God, uh, I don't want to. So she said, so I'll just throw in, oh, fuck, you know. And she said there wasn't a smile that, you know, oh, the, the room, everyone in their black suits sat there and looked at her. And she said, I knew that one was over. So, <laughs> it was. Our yeah, line oh, just one more thing. Oh, yeah. Keep coming. No, no, no. This is just on the way in because this is so telling of a line. <laughs> we're in the car and we're, we're pulling into the garage. And some people walked in front of us and she says, get out of our way. Get out of our way. And then she <laughs> turned, turned to me very sweetly and said, isn't it terrible how I treat people? You know? oh, if yeah, you're so, aware of it, I can't. But Lonnie, before I go to you, yeah. I keep forgetting to read donations. Guys, don't forget, I just got like two of them right away. You go to starsinthehouse.com. Donate, you guys. Donate. Yeah, donate. So donate. And then you email. Donate. We have to keep the theater open. Great. But I got two. Just I just got two very quickly. Amy from Maine, very specific amount, $257. Thank you so much for the wonderful entertainment. And then I just got another one from Arden for $500 from New York. So keep them coming. So exciting. Um, Lonnie Price, go. Elaine, what? Oh. Oops. Uh, uh, terrified me. Uh, just scared the shit out of me. Um, uh, the, 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 what I what I will say is that when we did the 80th birthday concert at the Philharmonic, and uh, I wanted uh, Patty to say ladies' lunch, and Patty was yeah yeah it was her first time doing it. I think it was, her first time. and she was nervous about Elaine because Elaine was going to be in the evening as well. So um, I was um, actually directing Desperate Housewives at the time, and I was on Wisteria Lane all the way up to Universal, and I have to call Elaine. So, uh, and it's on lunch, and I'm going, you, got, you gotta do it. So I called Elaine, yeah, and I said, uh, uh, hi, Elaine, well, you know, my, your voice goes up like 12 octaves because she's clarifying. Hi, it's Lonnie, and uh, anyway, you know, I have this idea, you know, Patty, you sing, here's your lunch. Dead silence. They said, well, it's stupid, but it's okay with me. 
And that was it. I'm like, thank you for your digital rights group. And then I called Patty, I went, you're good, you're good, you're good, you're good. You're good. Um, but uh, she was, um, yeah, she was, she was uh, terrifying. Uh, she insisted on in that evening of um, uh, wearing a hat. She decided she needed a hat for her, for her outfit. Diane Ben first and worked around, uh, did the clothes for the other ladies. And uh, we got a call and uh, said that the hat was going to be $3,000. How and much? $3,000. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little cat, it's a little cat. And oh so my gosh. Was like, gee, it's a benefit, you know what I mean? Like, eh, maybe not. And uh, at the end of the story, Elaine got the hat and took it with her. But, you know, of course, she, if it wasn't nailed down, she took everything. And always, apparently, clothes, uh, you know, the table, I mean, the mirror in the dressing room, whatever she could get in her bag or the suitcase. Uh, she took. But I will tell you a really nice story. Uh, the second night of that, where uh, I got a call very early in the morning from her, and she said, you know, nobody can call the director when they did a good job. They did a good job. And that was very sweet. And that was, um, uh, yeah, so, but she was, I, of all the people I've worked with, she she was terrifying, and because she was so terrified. She was truly terrified, and her only way to calm herself was to just <laughs> it was just to decimate everyone in her path. Um, but um, yeah, she was, but there was nobody like her. You know, you watch her work and she's extraordinary. She really can, I, can, I, can I just add something just real quick yeah. to that? I was there to, to see the concert, of course, and um, the, it, it has much more significance about the hat now since you told that story. Because when Patty was singing, does anyone still wear a hat? She just inadvertently looked over at Elaine wearing the hat and it got a huge applause. <laughs> it was really worth it, Terry. It was one of those moments. It was a $3,000 laugh, but it was worth it. It was, it yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It has more significance hearing the story now. I had no idea. Like, she didn't put any of that together. She just no. wanted that hat. She, she just wanted the suit. She wanted the hat. And here she is, looking great. Take a look. Like her. Nobody like her. Nobody like her. Nope. Tammy, Nobody like her. Tammy, tell your story when, when Elaine saw the picture of your 97 year old mother. <laughs> she saw a picture of my mother and said, Pam, not your best picture. She thought it was me. That was hilarious. Oh, she was too funny. You know, she used to. Um, she would ask such personal things and you know how she used to walk around in her underwear all the time backstage and um one time i went backstage to see her at a delicate balance and she said are you still living in cincinnati uh, you'll never make any money you gotta get back to broadway and she went on and on and on in her language and she was signing pictures by the way in a bra and girdle and pantyhose you can see her and jewelry and um i just said she said you know what i'm gonna leave your son some money when i die in my will because you're never gonna make any money seriously and um after she died, I got a phone call from her, one of her nieces, and she indeed had left my son, Max, some money in her will. And that happened years before, and I will never forget it. Say what you will about her. She just, she was tough, man. She could be wild, mean, all of it. But you're right, Lonnie. She was always scared, I think. And um, opening night in Boston, remember, Terry, 
in her scene when she forgot the words to her song and stuck her hand in her mouth. We all were on stage and we just about died. Uh, it was yeah, so traumatic. Stuck her hand but in her mouth. Somehow, mind. remember Terry? Somehow she got through it. But boy, that never happened again. But it terrified Hal, as you can imagine, and Stephen, and all of us because I've never seen that happen to her since. Or well, no, I take that back. She would forget her words sometimes. Oh, sometimes, you know, <laughs> like right, the last fifteen years of her life. Let's. But did it. anyone see her do a little night music? Oh, I have to yeah, tell a yeah. story about that. Yes, or her act, you know. But in a show up until then, like like Hal said, she never missed a performance on Broadway wow. when she was in a cast. Yeah, yeah never. That was cool. Yeah, Terry, you saw Little Night Music because you're in the original Little Night Music, and then you saw Lane do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, she had called me. Um, uh, I, I had gone to see it, and and I didn't go back because it was just, you know, it was just horrible. She was having such a horrible time; couldn't remember anything. And and then she called me and said, "Well, I want you to come." And so I didn't want to tell her I, you know. So so she gave me a ticket. So I I went again, and um, the, her first line is. Um, um, Solitaire. That's the only, you know, that's the first line. She's solitaire is the only thing in life that demands absolute truth. And so she came out and she said, solitude. The first word out of her mouth was solitude. <laughs> and then it kind of went downhill from there. And Steve was in the audience that night. Oh no! And, yeah, yeah, and so of course I went backstage, and and Steve was there, and this this is Steve at his most most you know this is wonderful Steve. Um, he went back to see Bernadette, and he was kind of trying to avoid seeing Elaine, and um, she was upstairs, and she came down the stairs, and of course, uh, you know she, they couldn't miss seeing each other. And um, Elaine oh said, I forgot a lyric or something like that. And Steve, with his great diplomacy, put his arms around her and said, the audience loves you. The audience loves you. I mean, it was just so dear. And, yeah. you know, that's what she needed because, yes, yes, you can't say enough how frightened she was and yeah. what, what a scared puppy she was, you know. But that was that was a, a, a lovely moment to kind of be a part of, you know. Well, by the way, we're you know, so we're here actually celebrating Sondheim because there's a there's a giant Sondheim celebration tonight, and that's yeah. why we're not, we're not doing stars in the house tonight because we want everyone to watch. It's for um, this amazing organization, A Step, Artists Driving to End Poverty, Mary Mitchell Campbell's organization, and there are a million stars doing it. So, Lana, you're always directing these Sondheim benefits. You're for the 80th birthday. How'd you come up with the idea of doing Sending the Park? The big Sunday song with eight trillion people. Who came up with that concept? Uh, well, that one actually was actually mine. Um, it just that song is so gorgeous. And, um, I don't know. I just sort of thought that um, he needed to see that the whole community. It wasn't just these bunch of people, but what he had given all of us, you know. And that it was all the people who were in New York working at the time, and people who weren't, and their children, and and I just. I kind of wanted to know it, it was an insular. It was really global. And um, and so when uh, all those people came down the aisle, I think he was truly moved and surprised. And uh, um, it, was a, it was a beautiful moment. We Yeah, it was just worked out well. But I'm very yep. excited. It's the most beautiful. beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. beautiful. Oh, Everyone has nice things to say. Lonnie, I'm so furious, and I'll tell you why. Um, hold on one second. Oh, good. Oh, good. Someone, hold on. Wait. Right after. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm curious to do, Lonnie. Did you ever see the movie um, Fame? Yeah. Okay. Remember that, that woman invites Leroy along to her audition, and then Leroy winds up getting to the school, and the woman doesn't? So, James, why don't you come over here, dear? So, um, I got asked to sing in that right. Sunday number, with, and I was, like, I was like, oh, James, you're an amazing tenor. You should join me. So let's watch, let's watch this number, okay? Here we go. Bobby. 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 Not that, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you can't have too much of that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, I invited James.
<laughs> Great. Okay, cool. guys. Do you see where I am? I saw. And that's Are you behind I mean. Nancy? Are you behind Nancy? <laughs> yeah, that's my head. <laughs> but James is in full view. That means this is what needs to happen. <laughs> but you were there. Oh, you got to gosh. be there. You <laughs> lucky you. Yes. That's the important part. There's a lot of double talk. Okay, <laughs> so before we go, um, Lonnie Price, I'm bringing on one of your pals. If you don't know, Lonnie Price directed the amazing documentary, The Best Worst Thing That Ever Could Have Happened. Um, all that merrily we roll yeah. along. So yeah. good. And I have one of your pals here that was in the show. Which is Liz Calloway is here. I'm so loving hearing you guys tell all these stories. Just <laughs> so amazing. Um, I have to tell you, I didn't know until I saw the documentary, Lonnie, that you, you know, everyone talked about how Company was their first album they listened to. And that was mine. And it, and it was also my first Broadway show I ever saw was Company. So for Lonnie and me to get to do Merrily, Sondheim, Hell Prince, Alvin Theater was so amazing. And I actually, I have my original. <laughs> oh, like, I love it so much. Oh, my, I love it. My parents saw the show first and they brought home the album and I just memorized it. I listened to it constantly. Um, Pam, I've told you a million times, you were one of my biggest vocal inspirations. But I remember- Oh, you're saw, so sweet. Saw the, by the way, Pam is the reason I think I learned how to mix, so blame her, Seth. Um, <laughs> when I saw the show after you know memorizing the album, I remember the opening number it's like, why are they talking? It was like, it was different than the record and the same thing with another hundred people. It's like, why are you talking? Stop it, I go, that's not how it's supposed to be. I thought it was, <laughs> I mean, I was like nine. I think I was like not 10, nine or 10. Oh, like, you kill me. So, and then, and then you lived in my building, right? Yeah, that was the other thing. I used to live in Chelsea for years in this little six floor apartment. And then I remember on the mailbox was a T Ralston. And I was like, I wonder if by any chance that's the Terry Ralston. And then we didn't leave until years later after that. So, and if one last thing, I know you want to end the show, but um, the best, one of the best days of my life was at Easter Sunday. The Easter Bunny gave me tickets to see the reunion concert you guys yeah. did. Were you there, Bonnie? I was there. It was so amazing. Easter. We went to church. Remember, Terry? We went to church before. It was <laughs> the most incredible. That was probably the most incredible live moment. I, and it was just. Um, I never knew you were there. And it was all sold out. It was sold out. And then I found out about it too late. And I was like, oh, man, I would have loved this one. And then Dan, my husband, put in my Easter basket. And I just, like, sobbed. Oh, and he's like, hi, you, so know what, you know what the show means to you. I, I had, you know, I had to get new tickets. So, so this is, like, very cool just to, you know. That, look that was all truly. I think it's cool, too. For you to be, you know, have that experience, I, I have oh, to say, wow. being a part of it was definitely generation. one of the highlights of my life because everybody there was mm. to celebrate this one. The first, uh, you know, it was celebrating something yeah. that hadn't been done before. They hadn't done that before. Yeah, right. And, um, you know, we were all still you know, in good shape as well, hopefully we still, you know, yeah. I mean, God knows we, we've lost so many, but um, that, that was truly that was an amazing. amazing opportunity. Yeah. That was my idea to do that. You know, I called up Barry Brown. I was doing um, Sweeney Todd or something with George Hearn. And um, they were trying to think of it. He was at Long Beach then, and they were trying to think of a fundraiser for equity you know, fights AIDS and stuff. And I said, why don't we do a concert of all the company people, the original cast? And he literally called me back about two days later and said, I think we're going to do it. Oh and that's why we did it first at Long Beach. I'm so and, glad um, you did that. I'm so glad you suggested that. It was, oh, just, yeah. it was, it was one bizarre, time. you know? Bizarre it was bizarre. And Lonnie, you know, I don't know how many years 
later it was, or how many years ago, was that uh, we did a, a reunion concert of, of the Merrily. And Ronnie, did you get the idea of that because of the company? Um, I, you know, I think by then there were they were sort of people were doing those sort of things. So, um, but I probably yeah, the company that probably inspired me about yeah, I bet so yeah. I mean, that was, that was another that was as a performer to get to be with everyone again and do that. That was top three of my life getting to to do that reunion concert. So, a, I've seen the bootleg. All right, so Liz is going to close us out with a little song from a certain show called Company. Yeah. Oh, wow. All right, so Seth texts me. Like, Why am I being blamed for this? Be well, quiet. You texted me, and you asked if I could sing something from Company, and I, I, I'm going to give it a go. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to stand because, anyway, um, this is... Uh, I love this song, and this might be a very strange piano track. So, can you still see me? I'm going to go to my. Yes, we can. We can yeah, see we're, you. We're going to yeah, clear off. We got you. We're going to okay. clear off screen. I'm going to give this a go, people, and uh, good luck to me. Oh shoot! <laughs> All right. Get it together. I know. It together. I know. I had a whole hour. Okay. Someone to hold you too close. Someone to hurt you too deep. Someone to sit in your chair to ruin your sleep to make you aware of being alone. Someone to need you too much Someone to know you too well Someone to pull you up short To put you through hell And give you support Yes, be
situations and boy did you nail it yeah. <laughs> i love that song i, mean, I love that beautiful song. i love that song oh liz you got high praise from t ralston so bye bye <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes oh i'm that such a big beautiful. fan of yours luckily I we've have. gotten to do a, a few things together lately yes, which is we have and pam we have and yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, i yeah. love it i love it so much all my son, I'm ladies. All right, so Lana, you're gonna come back from early reunion with Liz. We got Annie. We got a whole thing. Terry, we got a little night music. Pammy, you're this is your second time here. I love it. Yeah. Is, you're always here. All right, so everybody tonight, eight o'clock. Watch Broadway.com on YouTube. Okay. The big benefit. Mm -hmm. Step. Company okay. anniversary. You guys, you made history. Terry and Pam. Yeah. We did. We're still here. Fifty years. <laughs> We're still here. We still got it. Still got oh, it, honey. We all we still got it. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.